This episode is sponsored by Fire and Fuel Coaching, where I help you discover who you are and where you want to go, both on and off the job. For more information, please reach out to me at my Instagram handle at Jerry Fire and Fuel. Hi, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of Enduring the Badge Podcast. I'm your host, Jerry Dean Lund, and I don't want you to miss an upcoming episode, so please hit that subscribe button. And while your phone's out, please do me a favor and give us a review on iTunes or Apple Podcasts. It says, hey, this podcast has a great message, and we should send it out to more people. So please take that 30 seconds to a minute to do that review, and just maybe by doing that, it'll push this up into someone's podcast feed that really needs this message. And those of you that are still feeling a little stuck with your mindset after listening to these episodes, please reach out to me. I have this great program under Fire and Fuel Coaching that I teach you about how to have a mindset that will get you through the rough times and reframe what's going on in your life. You can find that information out on Instagram under Fire and Fuel Coaching or you can find additional information under Enduring the Badge Podcast website under the coaching section there. My very special guests today are Javier and Kathy. They're known as that peer support couple. They are amazing. They are going to dive down into what it takes to have a healthy career. And that includes on and off duty with your relationship with your spouse, especially. And they're going to also talk about what it takes to have a great career and end your career ready for retirement. And that means healthy, just like when you got into this service you were healthy and that's how you want to leave it because you want to collect as many of those pension pay checks as possible. You deserve it no more than anyone else because you have endured that tough career for all those years to get there. Now let's jump right into this episode. How are you guys doing? We're doing good. Right. Thank you. How are right. you doing? Thank we're you for do- having doing- us. Yeah, of course. I'm doing great. Tell us a little bit about yourselves and then kind of why you started the peer support couple. Well, I am retired law enforcement. I did, I served 25 years for two different departments and uh, retired at the rank of lieutenant. And so, of course, throughout my career, I saw a lot of officers struggle and sometimes sadly ultimately fail in their in taking care of themselves and, and working their way through the law enforcement career. And even ourselves um, struggled for a period of time after some several critical incidents that we had been involved in. And we saw the need for adequate peer support and for mental health counseling and things like that. And so that's how we created that peer support couple, just to try and pay it forward. We got a lot of help when we were struggling and we wanted to be able to help others who were struggling. Right. And uh, I too, I've been in law enforcement for 23 years and I'm actually getting ready to retire in August. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I was, yeah we're, we're, not that we're counting, right? Right. And I'm looking forward, I'm looking forward to it because uh, it's like Kathy said, she's retired and I'm looking forward to um, retirement because I'm doing everything that I should be doing to retire happy physically and mentally. Um, and uh, I had a great example through Kathy since she retired in January of 2019. And I got to see her career progress as mine progressed. So I got to see uh, little things that she had to go through that helped me in my career. So I'm ready for retirement. And as that peer support couple, we're actually ready to do more to help officers and their families and first responders in general uh, to get through uh, and manage critical incidents and the stress and trauma that happens to it. Because as funny as it may seem, me being an active duty cop has actually kind of held us back a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, and now that I'll be retired as well, we can actually be full force getting out there even more and delivering the message that, uh, of course, as everybody says, it's okay not to be okay, but but our job is to show you how you can be okay after a critical incident happens to you and your family. Awesome, I will dig down into that for sure because I definitely want to hear about that. So you're looking towards retirement, and you said you're ready to retire. Like, and you're ready physically and mentally to retire. How does that look? Well, you start first, your journey. For me, I started actually my educational journey once I retired from law enforcement. So I am currently in the midst of a master's program. Not very happy about it. Almost done, thankfully. But uh, so it, it looks like continuing education. 
uh, for me in my journey. And I still do the rowing machine to try and meet whatever the passing rate is for my department at my age and gender, um, just to kind of keep on top of things. We exercise every day. I do Pilates. So it looks like a lot of different things, but all things that we've learned along the way and not necessarily the things that we knew when we were in the midst of our career. Right. Okay. Can I ask, can I ask you one more question just about that? Mm -hmm. Cause I think a lot of us stay in the service a lot longer than maybe we'd like to, or want to, just because of our finances and insurance. Mm -hmm. Was this something as you were looking to get out in 2019 that you felt like you had a grip on? It was a, it was a big factor for me worrying about finances and things like that, especially with the fact that I was going to go back to school. Fortunately, my husband works for a department that pays well and I didn't have to worry about insurance or finances and also, I do a lot of part-time work. Uh, retirement is just a myth for sure. Because <laughs> I do a lot of part-time work and traveling that helps supplement the expenses. But it's definitely something that you have to start preparing for. You should start preparing for it at the beginning of your career and not at the end of your career. Right, right. It sneaks up on you. <clears throat> yes. I always say the days are long, but the years are quick. So <laughs> Start your preparation now. Right. And, you know, what we learned from our good friend, Nick Darty, who's known as that financial cop, <laughs> yeah. that you should start planning for your retirement when you are a cadet or a brand new rookie officer. Yeah. That's, that's how it's going to pay off for you. Uh, we wish we knew Nick. Early on. Early on. <laughs> but the, the, the point of it is, is that you, you have to start preparing for retirement day one as a cadet or a rookie because the career does go by fast. And I know for me, I've blinked and 23 years have gone by uh, yeah. and it's been an amazing journey. And like Kathy, I, I try and eat well, I exercise and uh, you know, we also exercise our brains. Mm-hmm. You know, we just don't remain dormant. And we're also very, uh, uh, very concentrated in the thought that we too, when we need to tune up mentally, that we seek peer support uh, from someone else. Mm-hmm. Or we go to a clinician if we have something that that is uh, beyond the level of peer support help. So we practice what we, we preach. Uh, a lot of times people think that we're this perfect couple and we're <laughs> far from it. And uh, we definitely make sure that we talk to talk and walk to walk. Sure. And to the best of our ability. To the best of our yeah. ability. Sure. We, really, we really do because uh, if we're not implementing what we tell others that is helpful, then what we have to say is basically just bogus. You know? Yeah. 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 I completely understand that. And I, and I think anybody like I do personal coaching and stuff as well, and try to do the same thing. You walk the walk and do everything like that, but that doesn't mean you're perfect. I mean, oh, right. yeah. And, and I think no if it, perfect person. yeah, right. There's no perfect person and there's certainly no, you know, couple that just perfectly meshes and everything's beautiful 24 seven. And right. That's right. Just, we always, we always joke around because there's been times when we've done presentations or we've done training and another couple will come up to us and say, oh, we wish we would have known y'all 10 years ago, 11 years ago. And we're like, no, no you don't. don't. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to have to ask then, why? Why would you say that? Oh, because uh, we we struggled. And in fact, we do a whole presentation on marriage um, and family survival in at different venues and things like that. But I would say 15 years ago, we were not in a good place and we were on the verge of a divorce. Uh, Mm -hmm. We had been through multiple critical incidents back to back to back, and it pretty much broke us individually and as a couple. And so uh, 15, like 15 years ago, about 15 years ago, 15 years ago. So when somebody says that we wish we would have seen you 15 years ago and learned all of these things, we always say, no, you don't, because we were working and I use air quotes, we were working on all of these techniques yeah, yeah. during that time. And we had definitely not perfected them. Right. And like Kathy always says, we were not a married couple. We were two cops living together in the same home. Who just happened to be married versus right. yeah. the way it should be a married couple who just happened to be cops. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I could, I could definitely see the, the challenges there. You don't have to go into into detail, but you said you went through some back-to-back critical incidents that put some strain on, of course, yourself and your marriage. And I'm probably sure those that 
surround and love you and care about you guys. Do you want to just kind of just briefly explain what those were? Sure. Um, we, I think the thing that we just mentioned is that we were two cops living in a household who happened to be married versus a married couple who happened to be cops. We were living uh, just like two roommates who were police officers uh, in the day-to-day routine of going to work every day, working shift work and things like that. And that's how we handled everything, regardless of whether it was personal, professional, that's how we handled everything. So when we were involved in critical incidents, it was, okay, let's get through it and move on to the next thing. And we went through in 2008, my corporal attempted suicide uh, while we were working and uh, he shot himself in the head with a shotgun. He survived, but that really took a toll on me sure. and, and a toll that I didn't, I thought I had recovered from, but we never really did anything. We just got through it. And then in 2010, my department suffered a line of duty death of one of our officers. And it not only affected me, but he was a family friend of ours and my daughter's school resource officer. So that really kind of, you know, added to the to the fire that we had already gone through in, sur- in surviving the attempted suicide. And then one month later, Javier was involved in a shooting. We hadn't even gotten back on our feet from the line of duty death when we had this critical incident happen. And that pretty much broke us. Um, we had been struggling. Our marriage had been struggling mm-hmm. due to a variety of things, just law enforcement, the shift work, the, you know, bad nutrition, lack of exercise, coupled with the fact that we, he had, he came into a ready-made family. So there were those, those, uh, what do you want to call them? Challenges. 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 <laughs> he did not have, he didn't have children. Um, and he came into a world with two, almost two teenagers. Mm-hmm. So there were those type of challenges, merging a household together, sharing chores and things like that. And so with all of those challenges that we had on top of these critical incidents, it really just broke us for a time being. Right. And the sure. thing that we also talk about is she experienced critical incidents in her life. Uh, and professionally in her law enforcement career long before I ever met her and vice versa. I experienced critical incidents uh, in my time in, in the military. I was in Mogadishu, Somalia in 93. Oh, and then, of course, some critical incidents that I went through as a young officer. So we brought our separate traumas into a marriage thinking yeah. that, oh, well, that's all over. We're starting new. Yeah. But if you're going to start new, you have to be able to say, I am uh, able to manage what's happened to me in the past. And I'm not bringing that back into my new relationship. Yeah. That's easier said than done, right? That's yeah. so oh, hard, right. so hard to do. And mm-hmm. I think you first have to recognize it. Recognition is the yeah. first thing. If you don't recognize it, then you're just piling it on. Yeah. Hey everyone. I want to thank my sponsor responder wipes. They're the best econ wipes on the market, far superior than any others out there. I love how thick and durable these wipes are. They're very safe. You can use them from head to toe and everywhere in between. The wipes are extra wet and leave you feeling fresh and clean. They also can be used as a cooling towel on those incredibly hot days or after an incident that gets you overheated. Please check them out at responderwipes.com and follow them on Instagram. Yeah. All right. So that's going to lead me into my next question. How did you recognize that? Did you, did Javi, did you recognize it in Kathy? And then, you know, Kathy, did you recognize it in Javi or? Well, I think that what I saw is that she was very angry. Mm-hmm. And what I didn't see is what, what I was doing, how I was acting. And it, it was basically, she's the angry one. I'm not doing anything wrong. You know, she's got the problem. Yeah. And, and the thing is, is that, that is not anywhere close to what it was. I was just as bad a contributor to the, the problems, but I did not realize that because it's it's one of those things where, oh, you can easily point out somebody else's uh, There was a lot of finger pointing. Yeah, a lot of finger yeah. pointing, but, 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 oh, but I'm good. And, and that was my biggest mistake was looking at the mirror and saying, hey, dude, maybe you're not acting up to par as you should be. So right. that's definitely part of it. Yeah, there and there's a lot of arrogance in our profession. Like it's not me, it's them. Mm-hmm. Even amongst our our fellow officers, mm-hmm. it's not me, sure. it's the it's right. the community, it's the administration, it's the organizational process. 
And I think my first realization of what I was like, even though I knew I was angry all the time, I just thought that was part of it. You know, that's part of the career. That's part of our culture. Right, right. right. uh, So it really didn't, like nobody pointed out to me. And then we went to post-critical incident seminar in Huntsville, Texas. And we sat down at the table and we had to do uh, mental health assessments. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, in my arrogance, I'm like, oh, this will be really good for Javier because he's involved (laughs) in a shooting. And so we're going to figure out what's wrong with Javier and everything's going to be fine. Well, it was actually me that was suffering. You know, I had anxiety, some depression, of course, anger. Mm-hmm. And I, I laugh and say, while this is not true, I laugh and say my numbers were 95,000 on the bad end and Javier's were like 35. Right. So so that was kind of a, a slap in the face for me that, you know, I needed to do some work on myself mm-hmm. and let Javier work on himself and then we can come together as a couple. Right. And the amazing thing about when we attended the post critical incident seminar was uh, my wife went out for a session uh, with a clinician. When she came back, I saw in her face, her eyes and her smile, the person that I fell in love with. It was like... Uh-huh. Like she's back, yeah. You know, and and I, I'll never forget how her face was because I could just see the change, the 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 stress that you can see in somebody's face that when they when the pain is in there in their, in their eyes and in their facial expression that was gone. Uh, I had Kathy back, and uh, that was an amazing thing. Not in a Jack Nicholas kind of way, like she's back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 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 yet don't we often just see things in other people that are wrong with us do you think that's yes. just a common a common thing right in in life and just in how we look at other people or ju- maybe judge other people yeah or even as in some cases as in our case I always thought if I could just make Javier think like I think or do what I do um, there's that control factor because we're all type a personalities. Mm-hmm. We want to control everything. And so if I could just make him see how much better it would be if he did this or that, <laughs> then everything would be wonderful. And that's that's not necessarily the case. You have to meet people where they're at. Yeah, you know, it's just like um, you know, when you when you're a rookie and you have your FTO and your FTO would tell me, you know what, a one call, 10, 10 different officers can handle this one call 10 different ways and it would sure. all be right. You know, we had to learn that. If I did things a certain way, I should not expect that she would do it because she was getting the same result. You know, yeah. like Kathy's right. That that control factor that we have as first responders is like, no, 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 it has to be this way and this way only, um, and that creates conflict. Yeah. You know, and if you don't do it this way, you're going to die. Yeah, that's yeah. that's what we learned <laughs> yeah. along the way, and that's what we try to force everybody else to do. Right, right. And that goes from cleaning the house to doing the laundry and and all Absolutely. the family things. Right. Absolutely. How, yes. How do you free yourself from that control factor? Oh, years of practice and learning. <laughs> Counseling. Counseling. Um, Post critical incident mm-hmm. seminar was very helpful. A marriage seminar that we went to. Right. Five love languages, taking the five love languages mm-hmm. test and understanding each other's mm-hmm. love languages. The five love languages, that, that is such a huge thing. Mm-hmm. It really yeah. is. Uh, Kathy usually tells this story, but I'll tell it. Uh, but basically, um, you know, with the five love languages, you have your own love language. Well, sure. the, the problem with it is you can't love somebody else by your love language because it, may, it might be different. Yeah. So when I found out that her love language was acts of service, uh, she was like, I don't want flowers or chocolates or things like that. Uh, to me, sh- showing me that you love me is when I come home from work for patrol duties and uh, the house is clean. The dishes have been made, uh, uh, washed, things like that. Yeah, you know, yeah. She appreciated those kinds of acts of service. And she saw that was the love that I was giving to her, to her language. I didn't get that. And it c- caused a lot of conflict because she went out there for 10, 12 hours on patrol, facing the same kind of dangers that I did. Well, she deserves to come home to a picked up house or some chores done in errands. Uh, and when I was, failing to do that, uh, to uphold my part of the vows and the pledges that we make to each other, that creates conflict. Yeah. Yeah. 
I can see that. I save a lot of mountain money on flowers. Yeah, yeah. I'm lucky. <laughs> Guys out there, I'm, I'm the lucky one. I don't have to buy a lot of flowers. And candy. Bring me some coffee. That's all I want. Bring me some coffee. Pick up a dish. Good. It was yeah. such a small thing that made such a huge difference in our marriage because we were fighting all the time about why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? Why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? Instead of saying, this is my love language, I'm acts of service. You don't have to be you know touchy feely or mm-hmm. or bring me gifts or flowers or anything like that just pick up the dish or take out the trash right and you know i'm the opposite right he wants he wants physical touch and he wants words of encouragement <laughs> and uh i had to, that was my part of the work was learning that you know cooking him a meal that he could care less if i cook or not he wants to hold hands when we're walking into a store he wants me to tell him what a good job he's done and um that that made the, a world of difference in our marriage mm-hmm. and letting go of having to control how he needed to be loved or how I needed to be loved is was a big factor in letting go of that kind of control. Yeah. So were you trying to love each other like like you wanted to be loved? Is that yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. I, I, I felt like that. I felt like he needed to have a clean house when he got home. He needed to have dinner on the table. All the, you know, the gender specific matriarchal, patriarchal things. And he could care less about that. Whereas that's what I cared about. I wanted the house clean. I wanted food on the table, you know, all the things done. All he wants to do is hold hands and, <laughs> and, and talk about, you know, words of affirmation and be kinder and gentler. And it was definitely a work in progress for me because. I'm a 25 year cop. I'm not very touchy feely and I'm not, you know, yeah. kinder and gentler, but he works hard to take care of my love language. So I work hard to take care of his. That's awesome. I mean, it, it truly is a partnership. Mm-hmm. It really is. And the the mistake we made is our partnership, like we said earlier, is we were two cops, as if we were right. two cops on the street in a partnership. At the end of the day, you went your separate ways and you went to your separate homes. That's how we were acting. Mm-hmm in our own home. And that was such a huge mistake. Yeah. I, I could see that happening. You know, you know, two officers, there's probably two different schedules and yeah, yeah just basically passing each other by. Oh yeah. Yeah. And there, there was at times we had different schedules, but there were a lot of times when we had uh, schedules that <clears throat> we came home within an hour or so of each other. So our quality time was at like three o'clock in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> At Whataburger, I don't suggest it. Yeah, having Whataburger. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if there's Whataburger in, in, in Utah, uh, but whatever local hamburger joint yeah. where you live. Have a healthy meal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we were having that the unhealthy meal, staying up late, going to bed, and then just repeating the whole cycle all over again. Yeah. And then having life, children, school, mm-hmm. all the things. Okay, so what's, if Javier's not loving you, Kathy, in your love language, would that say you probably make you triggered in some ways? And if so, how would you like say, Javier, you're not, you know, loving me in my love language, basically. I think, I don't know that I would use those words because again, I'm not very kind or anything. <laughs> but um, what it, what it looks like sometimes that looks like nagging. And I have to recognize that in myself. And then he realizes when I'm nagging that he's not doing something. And then we try to sit and communicate about what, what is going on. Um, You know, he's got factors in his life that I have no knowledge of because he's still working and I'm at home. I've got factors in my life that he has no knowledge about because I'm going to school all day, you know, online and I'm on the computer, but we, we try to now uh, communicate what, what those things are, what's going on, what the needs are. Mm -hmm. And, um, that's how we, it doesn't necessarily look like, well, my love language is acts of service because he already knows that. Right. Yeah. And he knows what makes me happy. He works every day to try and fulfill that. And as I do for him. Right. And, and, you know, we, we always equate things with similarities of of being on the job, but we always talk about proactivity. Mm -hmm. And proactivity is something that you self-initiate. Well, me being proactive with the love language, it's just as simple of having the vo- her voice in the back of my head, not screaming at me, but just having her voice in the back of my head saying, saying, look around, you know, look around the house. Uh, does something need to be uh, taken care of or pick, picked up or whatever? So I'm being proactive in that way. Mm-hmm. 
and say, okay, you know what? There's a little bit of a mess, mess, mess here. Let me, uh, let me fix some things up. Let me just, you know, get things back in order. It used to be a matter of, I would walk in the house and it would be a just complete disarray because we still had a child at home and just mess everywhere. And he would look at me and go, what, what's wrong with it? I'm like, look around. Yeah. Look around. <laughs> or her famous line was this house. is like a crack hole. Yeah. Yeah. We live in a crack house. Yeah. And I was like, well, I think it's a very nice house. For the most yeah. part. But okay. <laughs> but we just try and be proactive in, in knowing knowing the love languages versus talking about what the love languages are sure. and, and working every day to meet those, those uh, goals. Right. And when we talk about that, we see so many flashes in people's eyes and couples eyes when they, when they, when they get what we're trying to say, because what we try and do is we try and be a reflection of the audience that come to see us, sure. especially when it's a, a, a couple that they're there together. We want them to see, them in us and and realize we're just like y'all you know yeah yeah so this to do this type of stuff proactively doesn't Mm -hmm. generally take a lot of time does it Mm -hmm. no it doesn't it doesn't it's so simple it's it's such a simple thing that i wish we would have created it yeah (laughs) (laughs) and there and there's times when we're tired when we're cranky and we're feeling overwhelmed that we lose sight of those techniques that we've sure. learned but then we always recognize that we've lost sight of it and that we always go back to the same things right yeah keep it simple go back to your basics go back to your training go back to what you discussed with your significant other and and just be like okay we know what works for us we've strayed a little bit let's get back on mm-hmm. track and let's not get discouraged because we got off track that's what happens yeah. with a lot of people in life in general whether it's your physical health your mental health uh, you know, you you get off track and then you say, oh, I've blown it. Oh, so I just might yeah. as well just keep on going that way. For now, we know, OK, we had a bad week of eating. Let's get back on track. Or, you know, we haven't worked out in, bad in attitudes. You know, a week or whatever. I haven't, haven't worked out. Let's get back on, you know, walking together or get on the row machine or whatever the case may be. Yeah, we don't discourage ourselves by saying, oh, we, we messed up. You know, OK, we messed yeah. up. But we get back on track. now. Mm-hmm. Right. I think that's that's. That's so true because we we do get off track, right? That's we're just humans, mm-hmm. we're, and like we said in the beginning, none of us are perfect. If we were, maybe we'd be able to stay on track all the time. But right, you know, right. I, I guess what fun would that be? But you know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> but I think you know, it's just recognizing that you're off track and that you can get back on track. I think mm-hmm. too often we think we're so far off track that it's like why bother? This is going to be very difficult and painful to get back on track. And is it really right. worth it? Yeah. yeah. It feels insurmountable at times. And it, and definitely for us, because like I said, we were, we were on the verge of splitting up and, and it, it feels like you'll never be able to fix things. They'll never work. If we start with a clean slate with a new department or a new spouse or a new this or a new that, everything will be better. Mm-hmm. But you bring that same garbage into the next relationship and the next job if you haven't taken time to fix it. We're on the other side of it now. So we can say, yes, it's definitely worth it. Mm-hmm. We have a shared history. We've got 21 years together. And, you know, we, we watched my children, our children grow up. And, and so we can definitely look on the other side of it now and say, you know, some days it seems harder than others, but it is definitely worth it that we went through all that work because right. we're better as individuals mm-hmm. and we're better as a couple. Yeah, we, and we watch each other grow up. Mm-hmm. You know, it doesn't matter what your age is. You sure. can still grow up. Yeah. You know? Yeah, that's for sure. We're always in, well, we always should be in a state of learning and, and wanting to learn. And I think with that comes, you know, just great self-improvement and wanting to help the person yes. that you're with. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. If somebody, I barely graduated from high school. So if somebody would have told me, you know, 35 years ago, you're going to be in your master's program someday, I would have been like, there's no way, there's no way. But here I am. Yep. I mean, she's about to become a clinician, you know, so we're going to go from that first for a couple to that clinician, you know, which, is, which is, I think is fantastic because, uh, you know, she's going to be able to help first responders at a, at a different level than what she can right now. And it's just the progression of her and her career and her life that's just amazing to watch. I'm, you know, I'm her biggest fan, and I let her know that sometimes. And she gets bashful, and she, and <laughs> but it's the, it's the truth. I mean, 
she has grown so much and changed so much and I get the front row seat to watch it every day. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's important and, and fun to watch. Definitely see each other grow. So Mm -hmm. after your bachelor's and you become a clinician, how, how do you want to transition into helping, uh, First responder. A first responder counselor to become a first responder counselor. There's a big push currently for uh, clinicians and psychologists that specifically treat police officers and first responders, Mm -hmm. police officers, corrections, EMS, um, all the first responder dispatchers, dispatchers, animal control officers, animal control Mm -hmm. officers. But it's a push to provide services that you're culturally competent, competent in, meaning that. You don't necessarily have to be prior law enforcement or fire or EMS, but you have to understand the profession. And you also have to know the therapeutic modalities like EMDR um, Mm -hmm. to treat first responders. And so that I was blessed uh, probably about 10 years ago through a law enforcement management institute training program to meet Dr. Rita Watkins. And Dr. Watkins was the person that brought us into post-critical incident seminar and she has been my mentor and watching her when what she does to help fellow law enforcement officers across the country inspired me and motivated me to go back to school Mm -hmm. yeah that must be powerful to to, take take that on yeah and I tell Javier all the time like everything I am to this day I credit to that program because when I started that program they were they were like you get nine bachelor hours you get credit for this class you need to put in for it, make sure you put in for it, put in for it. And I'm like, I'm never going back to school. You know, I'm so many years old, uh, not going to happen. And then like every time we saw them, they were get these credit in, get these credit in. (laughs) Finally, I just did it to get them off my back and uh, so happy I did it. But it was, yeah, everything that everything that I became or that I am now is a result of the work that I put in, the work that Javier allowed me to put in, and then Dr. Watkins and other first responder counselors that I've been around in, because watching the work that they can do, as a peer, we can do a lot of work. We can be- benefit first responders in great ways, but there's only so far we can go. Right. Yeah. As a counselor, you can just take it to that next level. And understanding the culture and the profession helps quite a bit. Right. A good peer support uh, officer or firefighter or paramedic or or whatever the case, a good peer supporter, they're going to be triage for the clinicians. Mm -hmm. And we're trained as peers that we know we can get somebody somewhere where they're already starting on on a better path. But as peers, we're recognized to say, okay, this person this first responder needs more help than what I can do as a peer. Yeah. Now is when we do the referral to the clinician. If we wouldn't do that triage, it'd just be very easy to say, hey, I'm Javier, how you doing? I'm going to send you to a clinician, even though I'm just a peer. That would just overrun uh, all the clinicians with all these people saying, they, <coughs> said, they said, I have to talk to you. No, peers, uh, our duties are to do the triage because we can help so many people at that level and get them back on track. But the ones that we know we can't help, those are the ones that need to see the clinician. Yeah. Javier, how can you help people get back on track as a peer support person? Well, you know, it's easy to say it's simple, but it's not. But when you keep to your training, to the basics of what you learn to be a peer, you know, active listening is, is the biggest one. Because when, you, when you're uh, doing a one-on-one or a peer-to-peer session, uh, it's not about you. You know, you introduce yourself and, and let them know, hi, you know, who I am. And I'm, and I've been a, a, in a critical incident as well, similar to yours, but I want to hear from you. Talk to me. What's going on? And then you turn on the ears and you turn off the mouth and you yeah. let them talk and you observe their body language. You observe their eyes, uh, their voice. Uh, is it cracking? And you're going to start to see where, where they're taking you. And when they take you there, that's when you start addressing what the issue is. And it's really important to, to re- repeat what they're saying. So that way they know that you're actively listening to them and that you sure. truly care because, because you're repeating what they're saying and you're telling them, so what I'm hearing from you is this. That's how a peer session should be. It's not about the peer. It's about the person you're peering. And again, like I said, 
there's so many ways that you can help them get back on track because it's just basically a, a, a reframing how they see things. And when you see that, then you know, okay. And then it's, of course, it's important to make sure that they know that if they want to see a clinician, that there is that option. Um, but sometimes I hear a lot, well, I feel really comfortable talking to you. I say, yeah. okay, great. You know what? Uh, how about we, uh, we make plans to meet again at this time and date and do some follow-up? Um, because now they know that they have somebody that they can have confidence in, that there's the confidentiality, and they sure. can keep on having what I call a good conversation. And you're normalizing the experience for them. Exactly. There is the normalization right. of the experience. Yeah. A, a lot of first responders feel like they're going crazy because they don't necessarily understand what happens to your body mm-hmm. after you've been through a critical incident. And so just normalizing that event and letting them know, no, if you're shaking, if you're sweating, if you have nightmares, that's your body's reaction to what you've been through. Mm -hmm. You're not going crazy. Mm -hmm. And we're going to give you some techniques to help you work through that. Right. Or sometimes uh, uh, somebody who's in crisis will be like, you know, they say I'm supposed to be sad and crying and I can't sleep, but I don't feel any of that. So is something wrong with me? Good. That's yeah. good. Yeah, that, yeah, that's good. But you know what? That, that also means that you don't have to react like somebody else reacts because that's what you heard how you should react. Everybody's right. going to react differently, you know? And and they need to know that it's okay the way they're reacting because some first responders are actually, uh, I'll just say, freaking out because they think something must be wrong with me because I'm not sad uh, about what happened. You know, is something wrong with me? No, you're at a different type of uh, mental strength that you can handle it a little bit differently than somebody else, but you still have to, to, you know, get unstuck. We, we also, fortunately, people are understanding post-traumatic stress disorder a lot more than they used to, Mm -hmm. but now it's kind of trendy to talk about post-traumatic stress disorder and people will be struggling with a critical incident for maybe a week. And somebody will go, Oh, you've got post-traumatic stress disorder. You need to get some help. And that's not necessarily the case. No. You know, the diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder is post 30 days with, you know, 17 criteria. There's so many criteria for that diagnosis. But because that's the trendy word now, that's what everybody's using. Mm-hmm. And what about, oh, what about, so now the other word I hear is post-traumatic stress injury. Injury. Mm-hmm. And it, it's a soft, it's a softener. It's, a softener. it's not a <laughs> It's not a clinical diagnosis, but it is sometimes people can accept it better mm-hmm. if it's an injury because it's not a disorder. You can recover from post-traumatic stress injury. Mm-hmm. Um, and so a lot of people get fixated on the word disorder and they it's a negative connotation. I agree with that. It's, you know, again, that's the diagnosis, but injury is is something you can recover from, something you can feel better about, something that you can get help from. Mm-hmm. So I get the use of the word injury. Yeah, so, uh, so PTSD disorder, I think there's a lot of people still feel like they can't get recovered from that, that they're always right. going to be not whole or have this disorder or or something along those lines. Right. Well, I think a lot of times it's, it's when you're diagnosed with PTSD, you think something's wrong with you. Or it's a it's it's a uh, a scarlet letter, a, a shameful thing. Sure. I know I went through that myself years ago. I couldn't even stand the thought of being diagnosed with PTSD, but I was okay with a doctor saying, "Well, you have. How about we say you have acute anxiety disorder?" And I'm like, "Oh, that sounds fantastic. I have acute anxiety." <laughs> you know, it wasn't until years, years later um, that when I went through another critical incident and I found out that I was diagnosed with PTSD that I was able to accept it. But part of me being able to accept it was the fact that it's, it's been part of a normal conversation in the first responder mm-hmm. world that PTSD isn't necessarily a shameful thing or something wrong with you. Uh, yes, I have PTSD, uh, but I also take the steps to make sure that uh, when I have triggers, that I know what I can do to, um, to lessen how I'm feeling in a heightened situation, to calm myself down. It, it, I'm not ashamed. They say I have PTSD, and uh, if uh, I, I think it's another part of what makes me uh, uh, relatable to somebody that I'm working yeah. with in a peer session or addressing uh, a classroom of, of first responders or doing a presentation is the fact that, hey, I got PTSD. Here's what I learned how to help myself cope. 
And you can't, you can, you know, Javier is a prime example of being able to recover from it and being able to live a healthy, healthy life with it versus thinking you have a disorder and you're not normal and you're not healthy. And, and that's the, that's where the injury versus disorder come in. Right. Yeah. And Everybody can likes injury because you can recover from it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, that is so true. Cause I think, yeah, you have two choices when you're faced with this situation, I think. Right. Mm-hmm. Javier is like, you can accept yeah. it and let it spiral you down, or you can accept it and learn how to repair yourself and build yourself up. Right. And that acceptance, it, it's, it's very, very difficult sometimes because, uh, you know, there are times where you see a fellow first responder and they're in a bad way. And for whatever reason, it's all they know now. So they, that's, they think that's how they should live all the time. They haven't been shown the light or the discovery that, no, this is not what your normal life should be like. They've been stuck so long in it, they think that's their normal. And it's not until that somebody helps them and then they also help themselves. It's a two-way thing that when they get out of that rut, they get out of that manhole that they're stuck in, yeah. that they realize, I can't believe that I've been living a certain way for so long thinking that that was okay to live that way so yeah there is two choices um a peer can help somebody make the better choice but it, it's sure. a two-way thing the the person in crisis they also have to decide to need to fight for themselves right and and that's how you obtain post-traumatic growth mm-hmm. is yeah. is understanding getting through it getting the necessary help and and uh just being well so we we're talking about what should a healthy responder's life look like? Wow. Is, oh, I know wow. this is a, that's like, a, <laughs> we could have like eight sessions on this, right? An hour long each for sure. Yeah. We, you know, are you ready for the mini series? Yeah. Everybody? Yes. Yes. Let's do it. <laughs> it. It should, I mean, it, you have to take the individual personality into what their health looks like. Mm-hmm. Our health looks like going for walks going to Pilates, he does Krav Maga, going to yoga, um, trying the best of our ability to eat healthy, working every day on some new technique to be well, Mm -hmm. Uh, meditation, I started listening to meditation thing, um, versus the next door neighbor, who's also a first responder that does CrossFit every day, and they eat the keto diet, and (laughs) healthy looks like within mainstream, whatever fits your personality and your, right. and it, your thing. It's just like what we were saying earlier, how you can have one call and 10 officers work that call 10 different ways and it'd all be right. Same thing with your physical health and your mental health. You sure. could be doing 10 different things from somebody else and it's all good. So long as it's, it's productive and it's healthy. Yeah, yeah. Our, our profession, um, the law enforcement profession the average age of life expectancy is 57 years old. Right. And that's 22 years less than the general population. Mm -hmm. And so anything that you can do, like I want to collect my retirement check (laughs) as long as I possibly can. And according to statistics, I'm on borrowed time. Right. So anything that I can do to prolong that and not just prolong it so I can lay around in a nursing home forever, but prolong it so I'm still you know, chasing around my grandchildren in a few years and Mm -hmm. things like that. Right. Um, There are a lot of resources out there that help first responders, particularly addressing the challenges that they have in becoming physically and mentally well. And that looks different for each and every person. It does. You know, it's a simple thing. You know, you're the city government, the county government, the federal government that, that everybody retires from. We want all these retirement systems say, we're still paying these people. Yeah. When are they going to die? Because you know what, if, if a first responder dies, you know what, they're, that's retirement money that they don't have to pay somebody. Sure. You know, we all earned that retirement because we work so hard. So the obligation to ourselves is to keep ourselves healthy physically and mentally. So we can keep on getting the reward of all those years of service. Because remember the reward is of course, yeah, a great retirement. But the reward is being happy and healthy and being with your family. Because yeah. once you leave your department, your agency, you, you're replaced. You know, yeah. uh, they they somebody fills your slot. But 
your family could never fill a slot of you if you're no longer with them. Yeah, that's that's so true. I, I I'm a little bit afraid to say this, but only I went to a training this last this last week, and we'll find out who's listening because they'll probably come to me after this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I went to a training. And I was just kind of like sitting back and just like observing um, and just kind of watching a lot of the the fire guys that were there, and I feel like there's a lot of extreme living. And what I mean by that is extremely st- want to be stimulated all the time. That's through, you know, <laughs> it was like coffee to monsters, to cigarettes, to other different types of nicotine. And it's just like always so wanting to be stimulated. You see the face she's making? <laughs> oh boy. You're about to hear it. Yeah. I, and I saw, I'm like, gosh, like, how did we get to this point and how do we kind of rewind ourselves back to not wanting to be so stimulated all the time? And I'm, I'm, I have some guilt in this, you know, myself too. I'm, like I said, I'm not perfect either. And I I feel some of that same thing, wanting to be stimulated all the time. Right. That's a good layup. That's a good layup you just did because you're about to get slammed up. Okay. Yeah. I agree. (laughs) I mean, I, I think that our lives are, and I just mean our professional lives, are so dysfunctional as far as our health goes because of the fact that we work shift work, we work long hours, we still have to maintain a life outside of the of the firefighting and law enforcement profession. The hours are weird, and whatever they can take up to enhance that is what they're going to do. I remember early on in my career, the statute of limitations is up on this, but we used to have a bowl in, in our show up in our briefing rooms of like ephedrine and rib fuel and different supplements, uh, you know, whatever the flavor of the month was just to sure. stay awake through the night. And I think that's how we get caught up in this whole stimulant situation being, you know, cigarettes. I smoked for probably 20 years, mm-hmm. uh, supplements which now have been proven to be harmful uh, with ephedrine yeah. and uh, monster drinks. I don't even, I can't even tell you how bad those are for you. <laughs> Everybody gets the lecture, but the, the monster drinks and the, the energy drinks uh, enhance the, if you have PTSD, if you have symptoms of PTSD, mm-hmm. it's a, it's a brain changer. It enhances those symptoms. And so I'm always lecturing people about monster drinks to include my own children. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. who are who are in the law enforcement profession now as well. Yeah. But um, <laughs> that's how we get caught up in it is, is whatever we can do to stay awake, whatever we can do to manage our lives outside of this career. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember many days trying to stay awake through the holidays, uh, you know, just so I could spend Christmas Eve or Christmas Day with my children and whatever I had to do to do that, meaning supplements, energy drinks, Dr. Pepper, whatever it was, the ends justified the means because I was awake for all of those things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I And I can see that. And I, I know officers have a lot harder time with that because they're crazy schedules and trying to be with their families and you know, it, it's, it's very difficult, but it seems like it's, there's like, there's a, there's a level where you can be like, yeah, this is good. You know, I'll have one monster or whatever, one energy drink. And then it's, you know, you, then it's two and then it's three. And then it's like every meal I'm having one every, like, it's, so it's just like, it seems like right. it's a slippery slope. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. And, and what becomes the problem uh, and of course, a lot of people are going to be like, uh, why is he even going here? Let's, let's take somebody who is addicted to crack. OK, the first time they smoke a crack pipe, from what I've been told, is this euphoric feeling. Right. And then the rest of their lives, they're hooked on it and they're chasing that high. The first high they ever had and they have to use more and more and more. Well, let's switch it now to, like, say, the energy drinks. One energy drink every once in a while, like, oh, yeah, good. I'm, I'm pepped back up. I'm ready to go. 
but then it doesn't it's work. It's affecting your sleep and yeah. you're not able to sleep. So then you're tired at work. So then you have to drink the next monster drink. And, the next and we're picking on monster. Yeah. Fill in the blank. Fill in the blank. I don't want to. Whatever be, energy drink. I don't want to yeah. get negative phone calls from monster. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yeah. But you Fill see, in the blank on right. whatever corporation you choose to drink. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. But you, but, so that one energy drink that you were good with turns into two and then the three and everything. And, and then that there's that addiction, you know, sugar. Uh, a lot of these drinks are sugar-free, but you know the whatever uh, the chemicals are in these energy drinks, and uh, of course, like uh, Coca-Cola, Dr. Pepper, the sugar and whatnot, that's all addicting, you know. Yeah. And then you need more of it to get that stimulus. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. It's I think there's been a lot of studies that have showed how addictive sugar is in in like mice and like, hey, do you want cocaine or sugar? And they're like, no, we want sugar. It's way better. Right. It's, yeah. yeah, it's it's pretty pretty crazy, and I. I'm glad you brought that up because doesn't they know that big rush of caffeine and stuff like that increase your anxiety, which wouldn't that affect your, you know, your, your symptoms of PTSD? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And and I think that's been proven. Um, Dr. George Everly, the, the, the daddy of critical incident stress management for the international critical incident stress foundation talks about it all the time and how, it just causes this cycle of dysfunction because you're drinking the energy drink, just like we said before, you're drinking the energy drink that causes your body to react as if you're having that cortisol dump. So you're constantly yeah. dumping cortisol into your system. Mm-hmm. And then that causes sleep dysfunction, which causes mood dysfunction, mm-hmm. which causes anxiety, nervousness, you know, the shakes and, and all the things. And you just keep that cycle going to keep, keep feeling normal. Yeah. And Out of those uh, 10 symptoms, you just said, I was like, yeah, I'm pretty sure, but most first responders have eight of those. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. like, now, I, I will say that firefighters do a much better job than police officers. I'll, they, cause they, they talk about, they work in shifts together. They're not by themselves. They're, they're together with a group. They talk about everything. Um, they eat, they have the opportunity to eat healthier sure. than law enforcement. They have workouts built into their shifts during the day. So I, I do have to give kudos to the fire agencies because they do a little bit better job in uh, in taking care of right. first responders. And they have recliners that they can sit in. <laughs> <laughs> no offense to any of the firefighters out there. <laughs> yeah, it's just getting to them. It's just getting to the opportunity to get to them. Right. Yeah. I was just, I lost my train of thought for a second because I was just thinking about, you know, how it would be so nice for officers to have that opportunity to work out on shift, you know, and there's very few that do. And I know, it's coming. In, yeah. And then I know some in the Salt Lake area, there's like some sleep stations so they can catch a little quick mm-hmm. nap and stuff like that becoming more popular. Man, that would, People want to change how officers react on on calls and scenes and stuff like that because you're always supposed to be superhuman and supposed to be this right. yeah. great right. person 24-7 and never have anything else going on in your life and everything. I think that would just make an immediate impact into officer wellness, mm-hmm. which also translates into, I think, better customer service. Absolutely. You're, 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 you're right because, you know, we always say, you know, when, when we talk to... Um, uh, the administrations of uh, agencies, departments, you know, the higher ranking executive staff and whatnot. If, you know, the, the buzzword is, you know, the reimagining of, of law enforcement. Police reform. Police reform. reform. If you're going to reimagine your department, don't just talk about that. We're going to set up a whole bunch of uh, uh, classes that have to deal with um, racial inequities. Sure. Multi- multi- yeah. thing. How about let's look at our schedule and see how we can schedule uh officers uh, work hours where it's beneficial not only for the product of customer service and serving the public and protecting but it also gives the officer planned breaks uh, yeah. within their tour of duty uh it, it you know we we always say oh i hate it when we hear i hear well that's how we've always done it <laughs> yeah okay well you know what <laughs> if you're going to reimagine your agency your department your sheriff's office or whatever let's get away from that's how we always done it and start looking at how you can actually change the schedules. Doing doing everything that you can to have a healthy officer, a healthy employee, 
in a police department or a fire department should be at the top of your list of mm-hmm. police reform and not at the bottom. And sadly, yeah. too many departments have it at the bottom. But there are a lot of departments that are changing the culture in a good way. We have you know, departments with decompression rooms, like you said, where they can go and take a nap. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have departments that offer yoga, have workout rooms, workout on duty. So it's getting, it's slowly changing, but it needs to, we need to be a little bit more proactive in, in getting it done. Right. And then we'll hear like, well, the budget, you don't have the budget. For that. Yeah. Okay. Well, if you're going to spend your budget on all the super equipment that you have out there, if you don't have healthy employees to utilize the super equipment, then is that really a good investment? You know, there has to be an investment right. through the budget to get this mental health and wellness programs online and going. Well, sure. and you also you also take officers that fifty thousand to a hundred thousand dollars just to get an officer out on the street with education and equipment, mm-hmm. and then we break them and then we just <laughs> toss them aside. I think it would be much better for our budgets to keep this hundred thousand dollar investment healthy yeah. throughout their career. And so that's, you know, this is, these are the conversations that we're having in, in a lot of different places. And, and so hopefully people are listening. Right. And I think we have to change the culture and in, in the first responder world altogether. And I think we're always too afraid to look outside of the first responder world for things that may solve the problems in the first responder world. There's a mm-hmm. reason why corporate America and all these other places are changing the way they operate mm-hmm. and putting, I, I hope to say more value into the people that they hire and want to keep them, especially, you know, in the, you know, the times that are now, it's like very hard to hire people. And mm-hmm. so just like, don't always look to see what other, you know, the department next door is doing to, right. for the, the cool new thing, like think outside the box and maybe bring something new. And, yeah. yeah. And be open-minded. Mm-hmm. I, yeah. th- I think that's a big factor because I, I know early on in my career, somebody would have said, oh, you're going to be doing yoga on duty or cops would be doing yoga at all. At con- you know, now they do them at conferences. It's mainstream to have conferences that have yoga and Pilates. Mm-hmm. I didn't even know what yoga and Pilates was early in my career, nor did I understand that it would be helpful to maintain the mobility that yeah. is necessary to be a police officer and firefighter or corrections or EMS. Right. Um, but it took open-mindedness within our profession and our culture to get those things to become mainstream. They're not mainstream everywhere, sure. but it, it, we are becoming more open-minded and that's a big factor in, in police, you know, all the reform that reimagining that they want mm-hmm. is that we have to think outside the box and yoga and Pilates is, is coming for yeah. everybody <laughs> and it's beneficial. It's beneficial. Yeah, yeah, because uh, mobility is really right. that's how we get injured. Yeah, yeah, so much, and it affects what happens when you're not mobile. How does that affect your mental health? It, you know, right. it's it's all kind of tied together. So before I let you you two go today, like let's tell a little bit more about your company, where people can follow you and find you. Okay, great. Well, yes, we're known as that peer support couple. And uh, I always joke, I say, if you type in that peer support couple uh, on the World Wide Web or on Facebook or on Instagram or on Twitter, we're going to pop up. We're, you know, we're, we're like, ah, we're in your face. <laughs> so it, it's pretty easy to find us. Um, but if you do go to our website, www.kathyandhobby.com, we have links to all our social media there. Um, and, uh, you know, we just try and put the message out through all our social media. Sometimes it could be an article. Sometimes it could be a meme. Sometimes it could be our thoughts, but ultimately it's about giving people something to see to help them, especially if they're in a moment where they need to see something for help. And uh, we also like to point out where we're going and, and who we're meeting with and what kind of conferences that we're at, because we want people to know that, you know, we're out there uh, to help others. And if we're in their area, yeah, gathering resources and we're in their area, you know, and, and, you know, we would love to see y'all and meet them and hear your stories too, because your stories help us continue the mission Mm -hmm. of providing uh, peer support, mental health and wellness and ending the stigma and ending the stigma. Yeah. 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 Yeah, That's awesome. Thank you so much for your time today. I, that was great conversation. I mean, we uh, hit some things that I think that are 
you know, in, anybody in the first responder world and husband and wives definitely or gain some things out of this episode. And that's what I love most about doing them, especially with, you know, uh, you two, that, that was great. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you Thank so you. much. You know, we love when we do a uh, uh, podcast and podcast where the conversation flows because then it's like, Oh, it's over. Oh, I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> totally totally feel the same thank you thank you thank you goodbye everybody take Bye-bye. care thanks again for listening don't forget to rate and review the show wherever you access your podcast if you know someone that would be great on the show please get a hold of our host jerry dean lund through the instagram handles at jerry fire and fuel or at enduring the badge podcast also by visiting the show's website, EnduringTheBadgePodcast.com for additional methods of contact and up-to-date information regarding the show. Remember, the views and opinions expressed during the show solely represent those of our host and the current episode's guest. This podcast is part of the Everyday Heroes Podcast Network, the network for first responders and those who support them. 